Today, we are diving into a topic that's lighting up discussions in energy circles around the world, the powerful comeback of nuclear energy. But why now? What's changed? And more importantly, how can ETF investors and financial advisors capitalize on the nuclear power megatrend? Stick around for answers. Welcome to Shifting Energy. I'm Thalia Hayden with ETF Guide. We're glad to have you with us. Nuclear power has created a buzz in energy circles everywhere as nations grapple with the urgent need to cut carbon emissions and stabilize energy supplies. Nuclear energy is stepping into the spotlight yet again. Even industry titans like Amazon and Microsoft are jumping into the nuclear market. But why now? What's changed? And how can investors capitalize on this? Helping us answer these questions. Questions. John Champalia, CEO at Sprott Asset Management. Hi, John. Welcome to the program. Great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for having me. I feel like Christmas has come early for me. There you go. Let's get started now. There are many exciting developments in the nuclear sector. Just recently, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google have all announced billions of dollars of investments in nuclear energy to power data centers for AI and other processes. It almost feels like a nuclear energy arms race of sorts. So how do you see it? Yeah, no, it's been a a really exciting last few weeks in particular with a wave of very interesting announcements from big tech. And they're, they're really, I think, um, highlighting the importance of this technology and, and, and the role they see it playing in their ambitions. And their ambitions are about an AI race, as you use. It's, 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 a, it's a race going on right now. The US clearly wants to be a leader in AI technology. And what everyone is, is quickly figuring out is that AI-related data centers are essentially big supercomputers. And these supercomputers require enormous amounts of electricity. Uh, and if you contrast uh, a typical data center that you know you and I are using each day, to, let's say, do a Google search or you know putting our photos in the cloud, and when you compare the amount of electricity usage for that kind of task relative to doing an AI-related task, it's seven to ten times more electricity intensive. So one of the key obstacles in this in this AI race is obviously securing clean, firm power. And I'm going to focus on those two terms. Clean, because these big tech companies have very aggressive carbon neutrality goals for 2030. And if you think about Microsoft or Amazon, they're obviously not producing enormous amounts of carbon, but where they're being measured is around what they call scope three emissions. And that's where they are related to greenhouse gases downstream in their supply chain. And their supply chain is largely where they're generating electricity, where they're sourcing electricity from. So they're very focused on clean energy and that is obviously helping them make investments in solar and wind farms. But most recently they've uh, announced a flurry of, of deals related to nuclear energy because it's also a zero greenhouse gas emitting uh, form of electricity. The second term is related to firm. And it's a it's a it's a it's jargon that refers to electricity that can be uh, produced constantly, or as uh, also described as baseload power. And it's the opposite of intermittent power or variable power, which obviously things like wind and solar produce. So they're very focused on clean and firm because you need to have that electricity source that is available at all times to your data center. Got it. Now, small modular reactors, also known as SMRs, are advanced nuclear reactors with much promise. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency, SMRs offer state-of-the-art energy solutions. So how important of a role will SMRs play in the future of energy? They're really interesting for this specific application for powering AI data centers. Uh, And we're going to see a lot more news on this. And obviously, in the last couple of weeks, we have heard from Oracle, Google, and Amazon Web Services that they are all planning to help finance the construction of new small modular reactors specifically for their AI data centers. And this is very exciting because this technology is still nascent. Uh, it needs funding, it needs regulatory approval, and who better than big tech with big deep pockets of cash 
to help accelerate the commercialization of this technology. And if you think about why they're rallying behind this, it's quite simple. You could build a small modular reactor which has a very small footprint in terms of land, co-locate it right next to your AI data centers, which means you know build it very close by, avoid the obstacle of having to build a lot of new transmission lines, which can really get bogged down in regulatory uh, and lawsuits, and, and really you know co-locate that power so that you've got a secure energy source and it obviously ticks all the other boxes I mentioned. So this is really exciting because this technology has been talked about for a number of years and we do need someone to kind of step in and, and kind of kickstart it and help, help get to commercial deployment. That makes sense. Energy security is a big concern for nations everywhere. The problem is that political tension along with war, as we're seeing right now in the Middle East, can disrupt the supply of all important fossil fuels like oil. So how important is energy security and how can nuclear power help that? Yeah, I mean, I think for, for energy rich countries like Canada and the United States, it's less of a concern, obviously. But for many countries that are highly dependent on importing things like oil and gas and coal uh, and uranium, it has become very top of mind for these countries. They've seen how geopolitical tensions have frayed trading relationships. Obviously, a number of countries are fighting right now, which is not very positive. Um, and countries are looking to ensure they've got resilient supply chains. And it's not just uh, things like energy. It's obviously things that we need uh, to build in country as opposed to rely on other countries for their manufacturing. And that's one other part of this energy story that I think is really important to highlight is, yes, there's a lot of excitement about AI and, and big tech, but there's also a massive move to reshoring many critical industries that focus on semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, clean energy technology, defense industries. And in the last few years, there have been over 800 announcements to build new manufacturing facilities in the US to basically reshore many of these critical industries to the US. That doesn't mean we're not gonna be still beholden or relying on other nations, but clearly we're trying to mitigate against risks of disruption. And that's also creating a lot of low growth in the United States. And if you look at the last 20 years in the United States, demand for electricity has more or less been flat because engineers are very good at making things more energy efficient. But with all of these additional sources of energy demand coming to the grid, we need to make those investments in everything from small modular reactors, large reactors, and obviously a lot of grid infrastructure. Uh, and that's what's, I think, creating a lot of excitement for investors. Got it. Now, with the 2024 U.S. presidential election on everyone's mind, what impact will the outcome have on nuclear energy and the U.S. government's energy policies? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, we're, we're a few weeks away from the election and we're, we've been getting a lot of questions from, from investors around, you know, how do we think the landscape may shift? And I'd say specifically for nuclear, the Biden administration has been incredibly pro-nuclear, which is not characteristic of democratic administrations. Many of the bills, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Advance Act, these are all, these have all been bipartisan supported uh, and we don't think that there's going to be any material change one way or the other, to, you know, either way, depending on who wins the election. So we think it's we think it's continuation of ongoing support uh, for nuclear energy. Obviously, there are some elements of the of the nuclear fuel supply chain that we are still dependent on Russia. And that is obviously a priority for governments right now as they're trying to reshore some of that capacity. And that's starting to happen. But we think it's a uh, continued support, which is very, very supportive. All right, switching gears, let's talk about uranium, which is the required fuel that keeps nuclear plants going. The World Nuclear Association estimates that by 2040, the industry will consume 300 million pounds of uranium. How much of an increase is that from today? And what are uranium miners doing to prepare? Yeah, it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting question. And obviously with all of this renewed interest taking place around the world for nuclear energy in both large and small formats, obviously a key obstacle is do we have enough fuel to power all these new builds and restarts and life extensions? And the answer is today we do not. Uh, we have a supply deficit today. The world only produces about 150 million pounds of uranium. And the current consumption is actually around 180 million pounds. And as you said, is 
gradually growing to 300 million pounds by the year 2040. So it's a big, big challenge for the industry, but it's obviously a huge opportunity. And you know those demand signals are there, the price signals are there, and the Iranian mining companies are scrambling right now to move their projects forward, expand existing mines, restart old mines, and we're starting to see a supply response. But there will be a point where we, all the easy stuff coming to market will be done, and then we have to do the you know the hard stuff, which is build new mines, which hasn't been done for a long time. And that is obviously going to require a lot of capital. Um, the good thing is, is that investors are experiencing, I think, renewed interest in this, in this thematic. And so the uranium stocks have performed really well over the last three years. They are volatile. Um, there's no question about it. But, you know, we saw a little bit of a slowdown over the summer. But in the last six weeks or so, the stocks have really come back to life. And we're starting to see renewed interest uh, come back into the sector with, with capital flows. One more question, John, before you go. Getting exposure to the potential growth in uranium can be a challenge for investors. For example, popular stock market index funds often have minimal or no uranium exposure, and the same can be true of broadly diversified commodity funds. Sprott offers an investment solution, so can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's for the average investor, you know, trying to pick individual mining stocks is a is a daunting challenge, you know, they just don't have the technical expertise. Um, and, I, and I think the most popular way for typical investors to get an allocation to the space has been to, to take a diversified approach, buying a cross section of different companies involved in uranium mining. And Sprott does offer uh, an ETF that's listed in the United States called the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF, uh, the ticker is URNM, which tracks an index that provides exposure to the two largest uranium miners in the world. It provides exposure to about 20% actual of physical uranium through a couple of vehicles, and then a number of smaller producers, emerging producers, and exploration companies. So you're kind of spreading your bets across a, a broad spectrum of companies. Um, it's proven to be a very popular choice for investors. And over the last years, it is volatile, so warning, have a look at it, make sure it's appropriate for you but it has performed very well since its inception, which was uh, uh, coming up to five years this December. Thanks so much, John, for your timely insights, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for having me. It was a great chat. Of course. Well, that does it for today's episode of Shifting Energy. If you enjoyed the show, please tell us in the comments section below by hitting that like button. To learn more about the investment strategies and ETFs we discussed on today's program, be sure to visit SprottETFs.com. I'm Thalia Hayden with ETF Guide. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.